This is one of those days when you want to reverse things a little bit because the gospel lesson comes before Acts, of course, but especially looking at what happened in the gospel lesson this morning. This is the evening of Easter, evening on that day, the first day of the week, the first day of our new life in Christ, the first day of his resurrection. He's appeared to the women. He has appeared to the disciples now who are locked away, other than Thomas, who's out. This is that same passage before Thomas arrives. And what does he do? But he promises them some things, peace. And he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he says, I'm going to send you as I have been sent. And then he's going to say something strange about sins. And we'll come back to the sin part. That's what happens. And then the day of Pentecost comes 50 days later. Now, here's your biblical question of all times. If anybody gets this right, I will give you the chocolate that I have in my office if I indeed have any left. I don't know if I do, but I'll get you some more. What was the Jewish, why were all the Jews gathered at Pentecost? They called it something else. What did they call it? The Feast of Weeks. Who said that? What was the Feast of Weeks about, Miss Debbie, who just won some chocolate? A harvest festival. Now, when you have the festival of Passover, which happened 50 days before this, I hope you all know that Easter is the one Christian observance that happens on the lunar calendar as opposed to the solar calendar. Solar calendar, which is why Christmas always falls on the 25th of December, but Easter moves like Passover and always happens near Passover. Shavuot, I think it's called Shavuot. Shavuot, I can never say that right. Shavuot is Shavuot. Shavuot, Shavuot, that's it, that's it. She works in a Jewish school, this is why she knows these things now. Shavuot, Shavuot, instead of having no yeast in your bread, instead of having that, that unleavened bread, they have bread with yeast, wheat bread, good bread. And the priest would lift it to the north, the south, east, and west. He would turn, and then he would lift it up and then put it down for up and down. Everywhere you look, it's God's grace, God's abundance coming to you. So the Jews are gathered together, and what happens? Something that they don't expect. The Holy Spirit is poured out upon them as they gather in one place. Suddenly from heaven there comes the sound like a rush of a violent wind. None of you have ever been in a violent wind, and I'm guessing none of you have ever been drunk. Which is probably a good thing, as your pastor, knowing that you've never been drunk. It's not bad to act a little bit drunk with the Spirit sometime. And the fire comes and rests on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages. The Spirit gave them ability. They were all gathered together, and suddenly there is this outpouring of the Spirit. And Peter has his best moment ever. Peter, who had made so many blunders along the way. Peter, who had tried to walk on water and then sank. Peter, who had denied knowing Jesus. Peter suddenly is preaching with authority power of the spirit you need to understand this is a fisherman talking to a crowd of people from around the world who had gathered in jerusalem and he speaks with authority he speaks with power because that's what the holy spirit gives you authority and power and other people look at him and say they must be drunk nope they're not drunk it's only nine in the morning it's only 11 in the morning in the last days it will be god declares i will pour out my spirit upon all flesh your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. That means they're going to speak for God in a powerful way, men and women. This is the day that God has promised. This is a passage full of promises, isn't it? Just like the passage that we looked at from John's Gospel. The promise of God and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit promises peace to us, peace, not like we've known before, but the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, the peace of Christ, the shalom, which brings about not just the absence of warfare, the absence of malice, the absence of hurt. It means that there's going to be prosperity. It means that people are going to have what they need. It's going to mean that people are going to live in justice. Justice is going to come to the world. That's what Christ promises. Peace be with you, he says, and he breathes on them, and they receive his Holy Spirit. Then he says to them that I'm going to send you because I've been sent. So with that also comes sending. And then that part about if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. 
doesn't mean that you get to withhold forgiveness from who you want. We're all called to be forgiving because that is the way the world knows Jesus Christ, by our ability to forgive as he forgave us because what ultimately is going to free people from their sin but forgiveness, grace from God, that wholeness that God sends us in Jesus Christ. doesn't mean if you don't like somebody, you can say, I'm not going to forgive you because I don't like you or you don't deserve forgiveness. It means that if we're going to carry on the work of Jesus Christ, it means we have a ministry of forgiving love and grace and peace and freedom to spend on the world. That's one thing that I promised when I was ordained, and I'm going to lay hands on my boy Sam. I told you all about my surrogate son Sam. He's being ordained this Saturday. I get to put my hand on him with the bishop, and as the bishop says, take authority to execute the office of an elder in the church to proclaim the gospel. What Sam is going to promise is what people have promised for years. I will practice a ministry of grace and reconciling love. That has gotten me through so many times when I thought I'm not going to be able to do this job forever. When I practice a ministry of grace and forgiving love, it means I have to forgive people no matter what they've done to me, what they've done to each other, what they've done to hurt those they love, what they've done to hurt the world. I have to forgive them because I am a minister of Jesus Christ who has been given the Holy Spirit for just that purpose. But it's not just for clergy, it's for everyone. We are called to a ministry of reconciling love, grace, peace, and forgiveness of sins. That's how people will know we belong to Christ if we can forgive them in Christ's name. So we're going to move from resurrection to revival. Resurrection was what Jesus did. He was raised from the dead. Now, there were resuscitations along the way, right? Who was resuscitated in Scripture? Lazarus, right? The son of the widow. Jesus took pity on them and knew that he could heal them, and he brought them back to life. That's resuscitation. But only Christ was resurrected, and those who raised up from their graves with him at that first resurrection were promised in the future a resurrection of the body. Right now, I don't know what happens to people. People ask me all the time, what happens when you die? I say, I don't know. I haven't been there yet. But we know that to be present with God is to be absent in the body, is to be present with God. I don't know if we are immediately taken into heaven or if we rest in our graves until he comes, but I know that Christ is going to raise us up to new and abundant life in his name at some point. But until then, we're called to practice this ministry of peace, practice the ministry of reconciling love and grace and forgiveness and hope. That's what we're called to do. It's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? I'm having a really hard time this week, as some of you know. Uh, my mom just died. Her funeral will be a week ago tomorrow. It's hard. I found myself yesterday, I had so many things to do. You know what I did? I sat in a chair and stared at the wall most of the day. I called my friend who's a bishop, Peggy Johnson, who said to me, you got to be a little easier on yourself. Treat yourself like you treat somebody in your congregation when they're grieving. It's hard to do, though, isn't it, to treat ourselves with the same love and grace we show everyone else. When it comes to forgiving, sometimes we're faster to forgive others than we are to forgive ourselves. But we have got to live the life of a disciple. We've got to let that fire come into our hearts and light us up and go send us into the world. We've got to act like a little bit drunk with the love of God or we're never going to show that to anyone else. So I need your prayers this week, and I'm glad Alexa prayed for me today. That's what I need. I need prayer. And I need to pray for you all. We need to pray for one another in our need right now. So many of us are grieving. I look at the people who've lost their spouses this year in this congregation. I look at those of you who've lost your parents. Lori lost her mom just before I lost mine. Teresa Durbin lost her brother last week. Others are facing illness and injury. We're called to lift each other up in prayer so that the word of God might dwell in us, that we might send each other into the world filled with the Holy Spirit. So we're going to pray now. What I want to do is to pray that prayer from before, because we need to be revived, don't we? Revival doesn't mean to be brought back from the dead, but revival means to get that fire in you, get a little Holy Spirit in your life again. So I want to ask you now to call out things in the world that need to be revived that need the power of the Spirit to touch them. And then I want the rest of us to say, come Holy Spirit, because that's how those things happen. So what needs to be revived in our world today?
We start us out, compassion needs to be revived. Come, Holy Spirit. What else needs to be revived in the world today? Joy. Joy. Amen. Joy needs to be revived in the world today. Come, Holy Spirit. What else? What? Love needs to be revived in the world today. Come, Holy Spirit. Happiness. Happiness needs to be revived in the world today. Come, Holy Spirit. Civility. Civility. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Go ahead. Peace. Come, Holy Spirit. What else? Grace. Grace. Come, Holy Spirit. Unity. Come, Holy Spirit. Empathy. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. We need to pray for one another, and we need to pray for these things every day with that come, Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit will deliver wisdom from on high. Come, Holy Spirit. Power. Come, Holy Spirit. We need forgiveness. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Now the choir is going to sing a song that I love. And if you want to sing with them, I don't think they're going to fight you on it, are you? Okay.